Good evening to our listeners all across America and to those of you tuning in from around the world serving in our armed forces on this holiday. Our thoughts are with you tonight. The Twilight Radio Hour welcomes you on this Christmas Eve, 1943, to our special holiday broadcast of Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol, the tale of a miserly man who comes to realize the true spirit of Christmas. When this story first appeared over 175 years ago, few observed Christmas other than at church. Few employers gave workers off for the holiday, and the jolly country celebrations of England's past were largely forgotten in the cities. But this little story helped transform Christmas from a staid religious holiday into the joyous season of faith, feasting, and goodwill it is to this very day. Dickens' ghost story of Christmas opens in London on a cold, snowy December 24th in the year 1843. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. Ebenezer Scrooge was a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, a hard-hearted miser, secret and self-contained, and solitary as an oyster. A morose and lonely man who consorted with nobody but himself. On this evening, the office of Scrooge and Marley were shrouded in cold, bleak, biting weather. But external heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather could chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. God bless you, merry gentlemen, let them sing you this way. Remember God our Savior was born on Christmas Day. To save us all from Satan's power, we were born. Bah! Merry Christmas! Humbug! Be gone, you miserable little beggars! Take your infernal Christmas carols and get away from my door. So, so sorry, sir. Merry Christmas to you, though, sir. Bah! A good day, uncle. And you, nephew, what right have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Merry Christmas, bah humbug. A Christmas, a humbug, uncle? You don't mean that, I am sure. What right have you to be dismal about Christmas? You're rich enough. Don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be, Fred, when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas! If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would, ha, 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 would be boiled with his own pudding, ha, and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Keep Christmas in your own way, nephew, and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it, uncle. Well, let me leave it alone, then. Much good may it do you, much good it ever has done you. But Christmas time is a good time, uncle. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. When men and women open their shut up hearts freely, and think of others as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave, and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. Therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good, and I say God bless it! God bless Christmas. Ah, uh, you there, Bob Cratchit! Let me hear another sound from you, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. Now, return to those letters. Hmm. Yes, Mr. Scrooge. D don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us for Christmas dinner tomorrow. Helen would love to meet you. Helen? Oh, yes, your wife. Hmm. Why did you get married, Fred? Because I fell in love, Uncle. Because you fell in love with a woman as penniless as yourself, Fred. Oh, good.
Good afternoon. But you never visited before my marriage. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Very well. Good afternoon. Oh, I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. Mr. Cratchit, see my nephew out. Uh, this way, Mr. Fred. And a Merry Christmas to you, sir. And to you and your family, Bob. How is Mrs. Cratchit and the little Cratchit, especially your youngest, the lame boy? Tim, sir. Uh, tiny Tim. Uh, he's getting better? Yes. Uh, thank you for asking. A happy Christmas to you, sir. My clerk! With 15 shillings a week, a wife and family talking about a merry Christmas, uh, I'll retire to Bedlam. pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley, my partner, has been dead these seven years. In fact, he died seven years ago this very night. I am Ebenezer Scrooge. Uh, ah, well, at this uh, festive season, Mr. Scrooge, we seek charity for the poor and destitute. You see, many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? Uh, plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? They are. I wish I could say they were not. Uh, the, the treadmill and poor law are in full vigor, then? Both very busy, sir. Oh. I was afraid that something had stopped them in their useful course. I am very glad to hear it. Well, they scarcely furnish Christian cheer, Mr. Scrooge. A few of us wish to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We do so now because it is a time when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. So, what shall I put you down for? Nothing. Ah, you wish to be anonymous, sir. I wish to be left alone. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I hope to support the prisons and workhouses. They cost enough. Let those who are badly off go there. Oh, but many can't go there. Yes, many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Uh, I see. So the firm of Scrooge and Marley declines. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good evening, then. Very well. You have made your views quite clear. Good evening to you, sir.
trying to keep warm. The icy Scrooge trudged along through the dark streets, but just as he reached the door of his dismal house, he thought he heard something calling. Jacob, is 
there anything I can do? For me, it is too late. But I have come to warn you of an open chance of escaping my fate. You will be haunted by three spirits. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. The second the next night, same hour. The third upon the next night at the last stroke of twelve. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Oh! Ebenezer, look out this window. That poor woman and her infant huddled on the door step below. Look that you may see for your own sake. Ghosts, phantoms, hundreds, chain just like yourself. They surround the woman, but they're not haunting her. They're pleading. Can't she see them? They're anguish. Why do these ghosts lament, Jacob? Why do they wail? They seek the they seek to do good in human matters, but have lost their heart forever! They wail in unceasing torture and remorse. Beware this cruel fate, Ebenezer. Beware! 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 Nothing. 
There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should have liked to have given him uh, something, that's all. Let us see another Christmas. Come! Why, it's me! Years later, but oh, still away at this dismal school, alone on Christmas. Ebenezer? Ebenezer? <gasps> it's Fan! My sister! My beloved Fan! Dear, dear brother, I have come to bring you home. Yes, home forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be. That home's like heaven. We're to be together all Christmas long and have the merriest time in the world. Come with me. Let us go, Abby, this way. Your sister was always a delicate creature, whom a breath might have withered. But she had a large heart. She died a woman and had, as I think, children. No. One child, my nephew, Fred. Oh, how he does resemble his mother. Come to another Christmas past, a celebration. Fezziwig's warehouse. I, I apprenticed here. Why, it's old Fezziwig, bless his heart. It's Fezziwig, alive again, at one of his Christmas parties. Yo, ho there, Ebenezer. Dick, no more work tonight. Christmas Eve, ha <laughs> ha. Join in the festivities. Merry Christmas all. Come and dance. Hilly ho. Hans <laughs> have run and back the game, down the middle and up again. Do you recognize yourself, Scrooge? A young man with a twinkle in your eye and a future before you? Round and round, dancing the tiger. You'll quite enjoy yourself. Oh, it was a marvelous party, spirit, with cake and punch and cold roast and mince pies and plenty of beer. Both hands to your butt, bow and curse Fez, look at old Fezzwick, how he dances. It's glorious. <laughs> what a jolly time we used to have. Once you thread the needle. Well done, my friends. Well done. Ha 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 ha. It was a small matter for old Fezziwig to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Hmm. Small matter? Small indeed. He has spent only a few pounds of your mortal money. And look, is it so much that he deserves praise? It isn't that. It isn't that at all, spirit. Fezziwig has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it costs a... a... a fortune. What? Is something bothering you, Scrooge? No, no. I should like to say a word or two to my clerk, Bob Cratchit, just now. Scrooge, my time grows short. Quick, several years later. Ah, oh, Belle, as beautiful as ever. And I her. It didn't matter that she had no dowry. Oh, we were so happy together. Until your career with Jacob Marley came between you. As you gained, so you lost. Do you see yourself, Scrooge? You're older now, a man in the prime of life. Your face has begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. Your eyes are greedy. The eager, restless eyes of a miser. Oh, no, no, no! Oh, spare me this! Not this spirit! No, no! This music box is a beautiful gift, Ebenezer. But I realize I matter little to you. 
very little. To protect yourself from a hard and cruel world, you have become hard and cruel in response. I have tried to cheer and comfort you, but another idol has displaced me. What idol can ever displace you, Belle? You now worship a golden idol. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one. Oh, Ebenezer, you've become another man. Uh, I wanted security, success for you, Belle. I seek tenderness, not riches. Therefore, even though it is Christmas, I release you from our engagement with a full heart for the love of him you once were. No, no, Belle, don't, don't! Dear Ebenezer, may you be happy in the life you have chosen. Belle, Belle, no. Spirit, show me no more. Why do you torture me? <laughs> Remove me. I cannot bear it. Haunt me no longer, no longer, no longer. And now a word from our sponsors. Who has all the gifts for little Susie and Johnny on your Christmas list? Kaufman's Department Store. A short streetcar ride to the big store in beautiful downtown Pittsburgh will satisfy your every shopping need. From the little toy that train might that from the little toy train that Mikey wants to those new skates for Allison, Kaufman's Modern Store is brimming with friendly clerks to assist you with your purchases. And don't forget some perfume for mother and some new slippers for father. You'll find them at Kaufman's, where everything is sold at a fair price to all, even Santa himself. The Kaufman's department store. Put Kaufman's at the top of your holiday shopping list. And now we return to the Twilight Radio Hour broadcast of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Scrooge found himself, once more, alone, back upon his bed. He drifted off to sleep only to be awakened, again, by the stroke of one. Scrooge gradually noticed a great blaze of ruddy light glowing from beneath the door. Something was in the outer room. Come in, Ebenezer Scrooge! Come in! <laughs> he opened the door and beheld his own sitting room transformed. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove. Around the blazing fire lay a feast of meats and fruits and seething bowls of punch. And there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see. He bore a glowing torch, shaped like Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up, to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in! Come in and know me better, man! I am the ghost of Christmas! You've never seen the like of me before. Oh, spirit, conduct me where you will. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Profit still, Scrooge? Well then, touch my robe. And instantly, they were transported to the streets of London on a bright Christmas day. The shops were bustling, with jolly people completing their errands or returning from church. The grocers, the poultry and fruit shops, all were busy and all a delight. Presently, Scrooge and the Spirit came to Camden Town, to a humble house on a humble street. This is the home of my clerk. Bob Cratchit his wife and six children. Why are we here, Spirit? <laughs> <laughs> what has ever got your precious father then? And your mother, Tiny Tim? Oh, but here's Martha, Mother! Hurrah! Oh, sorry I'm late, Mother. We'd had a deal of work to finish up late last night. And 
practically out of way this morning. Well, never mind. So long as you are come. Sit ye down by the fire, my dear, and have a warm. Lord bless ye. No, father's coming. Hi, Martha, hi. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. 
who suffers by his ill whims himself, always. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not. Top of my <laughs> Still playing blind man's club? <laughs> oh, come now, top of my fellow. Helen's sister knows you're cheating. <laughs> I think. Oh, our furnishings! I know. Let's play at forfeits. Oh, yes. Wait. Let's play the game of yes and no. Think of something, dear husband, and we have to find out what. Oh, can I do that? All right. Hmm. Quick now, ask away. A vegetable? No. Animal? Yes. A friendly animal? No. Disagreeable? Uh, yes. Mm, savage? Yes. Grunts and growls. Talks? Um, yes to both. Sometimes. Hmm. Lives in London? In a menagerie? Yes and no. Walks the streets? Oh, yes. Horse? No, no, no. Then it's a bull? No. Tiger? Uh, no. A bear? No, but almost. <gasps> I have found it out, Fred. I know what it is. You do? What is it? It's your Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he has given us plenty of merriment, I'm sure. So it would be ungrateful not to drink to his health. Here is a glass of mauled wine, ready to our hand at the moment. So here, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is. He wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it just the same. To Uncle Scrooge! Uncle, Uncle Scrooge! Scrooge. <laughs> Come, Ebenezer. There is much more to see. Men who keep Christmas in their hearts. Come! Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful. On foreign lands, and they were close at home. By poverty, it was rich. In almshouse, hospital, and jail, in misery's every refuge, the spirit of Christmas left his blessing, Touch Scrooge as he went. Presently, they returned to the streets of London for the spirit's final lesson. But the spirit had aged. My life upon this globe is very brief. My time with you, Ebenezer, is almost done. Have you gained by what I have shown you of the good in most men's hearts? Uh, I don't know. How can I promise? Perhaps I'm too old to change. If it is too hard a lesson to learn, then look upon these. Look here, under my robe. What? Two frightful, hideous, miserable children. Yellow, meagre, scowling. Spirits, are they... Are they yours? They are man's. This boy is ignorant. This girl is want. Beware them both and all of their degree. But most of all, beware this boy. For on his brow I see that written which is due, unless the writing be erased. Without the spirit of Christmas to comfort them, narrow puritanism and greed would release these wretched beings upon the world. But, but spirits, have they no refuge or resource? Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? And with that, the ghost of Christmas present dissolved into the mist, and Scrooge stood alone upon the street. As the last stroke of midnight rain, Scrooge remembered the prediction of older Jacob Marley, and, lifting his eyes, he beheld the third spirit, a solemn phantom, shrouded in black, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. A am I in the uh, presence of the ghost of Christmas, 
yet to come? You are about to show me the shadows of the things that have not yet happened, but will happen? Spirit, will you not speak to me? Oh, ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I've seen, but as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me. Lead on. My accustomed corner at the Royal Exchange among businessmen. And here are my fellow merchants, as I have seen them often. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. Well, old Scratch has got his own at last, eh? So I am told. <sighs> what has he done with his money? His company, perhaps. Oh. He hasn't left it to me, and that's all I know. <laughs> it's likely to be a very cheap funeral. Upon my life, I don't know of anybody to go to it. I don't mind going, if a lunch is provided. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Spirit, why show me this trivial conversation? They can't be discussing the death of my old partner, Jacob Marley. Is there some hidden purpose? Where is my own shadow? I expect the conduct of my future self to provide some latent moral for my own improvement. Uh, I have been resolving a change of life, spirit, I, and I hope you can show me my newborn resolutions being carried out here. What obscure part of the town are we in now, spirit? This whole quarter reeks with crime, with filth and misery. Why bring me to this low-brow beetling hovel? A rag and bottle shop? Who are these grotesque people? Oh, look here, Joe. Let the charwoman be first, let the laundress be second, and, and let the undertaker's man be the last, you see. Ah, oh, then, what have you got to sell, my dear? What have you got to sell? Aye, hey, who's the worst for the loss of a few things like his? Not a dead man, I suppose, eh? Hey? No, indeed. If he wanted to keep them after he was dead, the wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? Messrs. Dilbert. Well, if he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death. Instead of lying there, gasping at his last, alone by himself. <laughs> Tis true, Joe. Tis the truest word that was ever spoke. So judge, my lord of an ace. Huh? What's this? Bed curtains? <laughs> yes! Bed curtains! <laughs> you don't mean to say you took them down rings and all when I'm a lion air. And why not? Uh, don't drop that lamp so you'll unbond the blankets now. His blankets, too? Oh, and this fine shirt. It's a best he had. They'd have wasted it by dressing him up if it hadn't been for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, spirit, I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. What is this? A bare, uncurtained bed. The shrouded body of the plundered unknown man. He lay here with no one to say he was kind to me. And for the memory of one kind word, I will be kind to him. Spirit, you point to the head of this corpse. Do you wish me to remove the cover? Spirit, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I, I shall not leave its lesson. Uh, trust me, uh, let us go. 
I understand you, and I would do it if I could, but I have not the power, spirit. I have not the power. No, oh, let me see some tenderness connected with the death, or this dark chamber will be forever present to me. Once more are we at the home of Bob Cratchit, but it is different, so quiet. What is it, spirit? What kind of Christmas day is this? And he took a child and set him in the midst of them, and answered, I say unto you, that none but those who are as humble as little children shall enter into heaven. Whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. Stop, Peter, stop reading. Oh, my son, my son, tiny Tim. Mother, please don't cry. Father will be home soon. Don't let him know you've been crying. He's late tonight, Martha. When he had tiny Tim on his shoulder, he would walk very fast, very fast indeed. But the child was light to carry, and father loved him so. It was no trouble, no trouble at all. <laughs> he is father now. Sorry I'm late, mother. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised. I promised Tim that we'd walk there on Sundays. Oh, Bob. <laughs> My little child. My little, little child. Oh, spirit, not tiny Tim. Spectre, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. Tell me. What man was that whom we saw lying dead? Christmas time be praised for this. 
I, I don't know what day of the month it is. I, I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. <laughs> oh, I am light as a feather, as happy as an angel, as merry as a schoolboy, as giddy as a drunken man. <laughs> oh, glorious light, fresh air, the window. Why? Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! And a happy New Year, sir. Uh, boy, boy, what's today? Oh, what day is it, my fine fellow? <laughs> today? Why it's Christmas Day, sir? Christmas Day? <gasps> I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. <laughs> oh, boy, uh, do you know the poulterers in the next street at the corner? I should sure hope I did. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? What? The one as big as me? Lord, it's hanging there now. Is it? Ah, well, uh, go and buy it. What girl? No, no, I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here, that I may make a certain uh, clerk very happy. Scrooge sent the boy to buy the prize turkey and have it delivered to the Cratchit family as an anonymous gift. Then, the new Ebenezer Scrooge dressed himself all in his best and got out into the streets of London. By this time, people were pouring forth and Scrooge regarded all with a delighted smile and hearty holiday greeting. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! <laughs> By mere chance, Scrooge came upon the charity seekers he had dismissed yesterday, but today he apologized and made a large donation to their worthy cause, with many back payments included. He went to church, walked about the streets, watched the people hurrying to and fro. He pats children on the head, questioned beggars, and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that any thing, could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, Scrooge turned his steps to the door of his nephew Fred, who was in the midst of Christmas dinner with his wife and their many hungry friends. Uh, Uncle Ebenezer, why, I can't believe you're really here at my home on Christmas. Uh, I come to make your pardon, Fred for the things I said about Christmas. Uh, that was a humbug. Uh, well, uh, I, I don't know what to say. Um, do come in. Helen, look. Uh, well, may I present my wife, Helen? Uh, Uncle Ebenezer, I, I never expected this of you. Oh, Helen, so pleased to meet you. But can you forgive an old fool? Oh, of course, Uncle, of course. Well, join the feast. Set another place at the table. Here, here, raise your glasses all. I propose a toast. A toast to Uncle Scrooge. To Uncle, Uncle Scrooge! Scrooge. Oh, thank you, thank you. Rejoined the family of man. The next morning, Scrooge was early at the office. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Crap to coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. And was Bob ever late? The clock had struck nine. No Bob. Caught past. No Bob. Finally. Mr. Cratchit! <laughs> what do you mean by coming in at this time of day? Uh, I I'm very sorry, sir. I, I am behind my time. It, it shall not be repeated. Uh, I was making rather a merry uh, yesterday, sir. Bob Cratchit, I'll not stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, 
Therefore, I am about to raise your salary. <laughs> oh, please, sir. You're, you're going to raise my salary? But, sir... No, Bob, I've not lost my senses. I've come to them. <laughs> a Merry Christmas, Bob. A merrier Christmas than I have given you for many a year. Yes, I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family. We will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. Bob Pratchett, Merry Christmas! <laughs> And Scrooge was better than his word. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city ever knew. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he became a second father. And it was always said that Ebenezer Scrooge knew how to keep Christmas well. May that be truly said of us, all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim sagely observed, God bless us, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, all through our holiday playhouse, not a creature is stirring that doesn't wish our radio audience a merry, merry Christmas. This goes for all of us, from our Walla Walla vocalizers, Merry Christmas, from our sound effects crew of joyful noisemakers, you get the idea. From our director and engineer, Merry Christmas! And from our wonderful cast, Merry Christmas! This story was adapted for radio and scored by Anthony E. Palermo. If our little production has provided you and your family with good cheer, then you have only to thank Charles Dickens, the founder of our feast and this fairy tale for all the ages. Especially our own. And so, as Tiny Tim safely observed, God bless us, everyone! This has been a very merry production of the Twilight Radio Hour and WAHS Pittsburgh, PA, saying good night, happy holidays, and peace in the new year to you and yours. And to all of those fighting for freedom in far flung places throughout the world, good night. <laughs> <laughs>